Hello. Over the course of the last week, I have been testing a couple of typical pan and tilt IP cameras. And in this video, I will demonstrate some of the basic capabilities of these cameras. And that might be interesting to those of you who have maybe heard about IP cameras, but are not sure what they actually can and can't do. But I will also do something of a review of these three cameras and compare their capabilities in terms of functionality, picture quality and so on. And that might be interesting to those of you who have already thought about buying an IP camera, but are not sure what they can actually expect for their money. Now let me demonstrate some of the basic features that most of these cameras offer. Upon connecting them to a power supply, most of these pan and tilt cameras go through a basic startup routine in which the motors for both the panning and tilting are activated and the homing position of the camera is determined. But how do you actively control these movements? Well, one way to do it is to install an app on your phone. And as you can see here, it allows you to have a live video stream and also control where the camera is pointing. You can pan and tilt and often also zoom, even though in this case it is just a digital zoom. One downside of these apps is that most of the manufacturers of these cheap cameras offer their own apps that are not compatible with models of other manufacturers. But at least they typically don't charge any money for those apps. And you can also use these apps to command the camera to actively store still pictures or video material of what you just see on the screen. Typically these cameras come with a limited amount of internal flash memory on which those files can be stored. But modern IP cameras often also have a micro SD card slot on the back side. Then there is also the possibility to store your material on an FTP server. And I will say a little more about that when we will talk about security issues of these cameras later in the video. But these cameras do not just provide a video stream. They also allow for two-way audio communication. But if you can't get your message across, you can also connect a PA or an amplifier of some kind to the audio output jack on the back side of the camera. You better get off the property now! But if you wanted to employ such a camera to secure your house, office, workshop and so on, it of course wouldn't be of much use if you had to watch the actual live stream all the time. And that is why a motion detection feature is typically included into the apps that come with the cameras. You can typically activate it in the menu of your app and you also can set a sensitivity level for the motion detection while most of the time a low number like your one means actually a high level of sensitivity. And you can then also set up an email service where the camera will email you when the motion detection function is triggered. So I will test that now and walk into the workshop. And there is the mail that I just got. The mail came with a delay of just a couple of seconds and there are two still pictures attached that show me entering the workshop and going to the workbench. But to be honest, the quality of the motion detection apps that come with these cheap cameras are typically of very low quality. They are often either much too sensitive or not sensitive enough. They might react to a car driving by next to the house, casting a little bit of shadow into the room or maybe a fly flying through the room. So it would be better to use a more professional software, which can be hard when you have no name hardware, or you could attach an external motion detector like passive infrared motion detector or radar detector or something like that. And for that, some of the cameras come with an input jack. That's two of the pins on this green connector here. And this is where an external motion detector sensor could be attached. The other two pins of the green connector, by the way, are connected to a relay. And those are output pins that can be used to switch an external device on and off by means of the camera. Okay, so far so good, but the footage that we just saw was recorded in a very well-lit workshop environment. What about the night hours? What about completely dark rooms? Which is most probably what a burglar would encounter. Well, to solve that problem, a range of infrared LEDs is added to the front of the camera. 
These cameras are also emitting a faint red light that you can see in the darkness, but that just happens to be a little fraction of the energy that is coming out of the LEDs that happens to be within the visible spectrum. The vast majority of the light emitted is within the uh, wavelength of the infrared or IR. And it is invisible to the human eye, but not to the CMOS chip inside the camera. You know, it can be converted to electronic signals that can then be output on a display as light within the visible spectrum. And what we have here is an LDR or a light dependent resistor. And that is there in order to determine how bright the surroundings of the camera actually are. Because it wouldn't be always good to turn on the IR lights, for example, when it's bright outside anyways. This, by the way, is just a pretty useless status LED that is blinking all the time. And now there are actually only two connectors left that we haven't talked about yet. One of them is just a network connector. You attach a cable to this and plug it into your router when you want to set up the camera for the first time. And you can do that in order to use Wi-Fi. And you have a Wi-Fi antenna like this one that you can screw onto a jack that is sitting on the back side of the camera. Now, you could still not use Wi-Fi if you want to, but I can tell you that the reach of these cameras is actually quite good, even if you have several ceilings and walls between them and quite a distance, they can still have a good connection to your router. Okay, so far I have tried my best to talk about the most basic features of these cameras in an easily understandable way, I hope. But another thing that I haven't talked about yet at all are security issues. And I would say there are two groups of issues that are very different in nature. The first one is that these kinds of cameras can easily be attacked. They could be stolen or destroyed. The same goes for the micro SD cards inside the cameras. And a potential burglar could simply remove them or destroy them and you would have no way of even showing your footage to the police or anything like that because they are stored inside the cameras. Now a way to circumvent that would be to use an FTP server that stands for File Transfer Protocol. You could, you could have such a server in your house, maybe in a hidden place or use one that you rent on the internet. Now, another thing is that you're most probably going to use Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi can be jammed with a Wi-Fi jammer. Now, devices like that are prohibited in most countries, but what does a criminal care, right? Now, if you wanted to use IP cameras and feel really secure, you would have to inform yourself about the dangers of using like a DDNS service, for example, or the kind of web hosting services that might be employed by the manufacturers of these cameras in order for you to be able to stream the video onto your mobile devices. But there is also one very obvious and easy to solve security risk that I want to show you now. Here I am on a website called Insecam. Now it has been online, I guess, since 2014 and it provides everyone with thousands of video streams, many of them from private surveillance cameras. And as you can see on the left, the camera streams are listed by country of origin. The most of them are in the United States. And let's just click on the United States and take a look at the first few cameras that we find here. Now, some of them might be open to the public on purpose, like open webcams that you sometimes find on, I don't know, bell towers or something like that. Now, the website states that by now there are no more private cameras available here, but I don't believe that because they say that you have to actively complain so that they get taken down. This looks pretty much just like a private backyard. And see this picture here from Atlanta, Georgia, showing us, I don't know, some guy's barbecue. Uh, let's just try to enter this. And here I'm just entering admin and password blank or no password. And here I am on the camera's browser interface. And I'm now pretty much free to do what I want with it. 
And if you can believe the official statements of Insecam.com, then this page was only set up in order to raise awareness about the problem of insecure IP cameras. And they also said that the vast majority of these cameras wouldn't be accessible if the owners had simply changed the default password that is often the same for many or all models of one manufacturer. And what you're looking at here is the label from a broken IP camera that I took apart a couple of days ago and I will show a teardown video of that in the near future. But what I want to talk about here is something else. Up here you can see the Mac ID of this device. Every IP camera has such an individual Mac ID that consists of several pairs of hex numbers. And this Mac ID can help you to find out the actual manufacturer of your cheap IP cameras. What do I mean by that? Well, see, this camera was sold under the name Premium Blue, but that is just a made up trade name. There is no Premium Blue Electronics Corporation anywhere to be found. But if you take the Mac ID, and write down the first three hex numbers and go on this homepage right here. You can use Control F to search through this text document and find out who the actual manufacturer of this camera is. So in this way, I could find out that my so-called premium blue camera was actually manufactured by the Apexis Corporation from Shenzhen, China. And it is a popular model that was sold under many different names. And I also found out that one of the cameras that I wanted to review for this video, this Logilink camera here, is also the exact same model manufactured by the Apexis Corporation. And finding out the actual manufacturer is important if you plan to use better software than the programs that came with the camera that you bought. Because if you don't know the manufacturer and the type of the camera, you will have a hard time finding software that supports that particular piece of hardware. And I will put the URL to the IEEE homepage where you can look up the three hex numbers from the Mac ID, as well as an online description that tells you how to find out the Mac ID of your device if it is not printed on a label outside of the camera. Into the video description. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna do is to show you a direct comparison of the video quality and the features that come with the three different models of IP cameras that I have here in the workshop. The first one is the Apexis APM-J011. And as I just told you, I bought that model two times without knowing it because it was sold under the names Premium Blue and Logilink. I'm sure there are a lot of other trade names, especially also in other countries, for this exact same model. Now, I paid 20 bucks for the first one because it was sold as a returned article, so it was probably broken from the beginning, and I was planning on doing a teardown with this, so it didn't matter. For the other one, however, I paid 35 euros and as I said, the exact same model. Now the video quality, both in bright and in totally dark surroundings is absolutely horrendous. I would have guessed that this is technology from like 2005 or something, but date codes inside the premium blue camera told me that it's actually quite new and I guess manufactured in 2014. It doesn't have an SD card slot and very limited internal memory and it also comes with absolutely horrible software so I really don't recommend to buy this particular piece of trash. Now the next model that I bought is the 3Cam SP011 and it is a unit that I bought from eBay for 2757. Every time it goes into the startup routine, you have a feeling that it might destroy itself, but somehow it has survived so far and does work kind of well. It does provide you with a 720p stream though, and the picture quality both day and night is much better than that of the Apexis model that we saw before. This model can also pan and tilt much faster than the other models but it is also very loud and I'm quite sure that it doesn't use stepper motors but very cheap brushed DC geared motors to do the panning and tilting. The manufacturer by the way provides a website with FAQs and support but it is horribly slow. It took me about 15 minutes to download a 7 megabyte PDF file and the instructions that you get in there are very poor. 
Also, I couldn't get the SD card support running so far. But all in all, I would say it's still a much better product for the money than the Apexis camera. So the third model is the so-called IdeaNext DEC1704B, which according to the Mac ID was manufactured by a company called Billion Electronics in, you guessed it, Shenzhen, China. And the camera cost me $89.99 on Amazon.com and is thus of course three times as expensive as the other cameras. But you also get a much better picture, this time even in 1080p, and the camera will still provide you with a reasonable color video image when the other cameras are already in night vision mode. But to be honest, I guess it's better to simply buy a brand name product for a little more money because then you will have better chances that professional software will know the type of hardware that you're using. While as I couldn't find any entry for the Billion Electronics Company in any of the software that I have tried so far. So I guess my take on all of this is that if you just want to play around with an IP camera, buy one of those three cams because they're really cheap and the picture is okay. While I guess that they are not very reliable and if I see how this thing acts in the startup routine, I guess that it will be broken in no time. But if you want to secure your house, I guess that a 1080p camera with good night vision capability is really the bottom line. And I'm sorry to tell you that those are still not quite as cheap as what you might wish. But the question if I will find a better solution than this is still open. Okay, as of today, I'm still not sure if I will even use the IP cams for myself or if I will send them all back because I think that some of the security risks are just too big. But I also worked on some other projects. For example, I bought this little camera here for this Raspberry Pi 2 and I'm still thinking about if I can maybe find a solution based around Raspberry Pi that is actually better than an IP camera and costs about the same or maybe less because this is also a 1080p camera and the quality of the picture is quite okay. I also worked a little bit on my Fallout style computer here if you remember that. So now this computer can basically run without anyone noticing and I'm thinking about using this for some kind of FTP server. But yeah, I still have to figure out how to do that really. Then I also, as I already said, took one of those cameras apart, a clone of this Apexis here. And the next video will then be, I guess, about this teardown. So I hope you like this and see you soon.